Her research interest lies primarily in the field of cancer survivorship care with a focus on psychosocial adaptation and post-treatment reintegration among young adult cancer survivors. Currently, she's working on a feasibility pilot study on an exercise intervention for young adult lymphoma survivors, which we're about to hear about. So take it away, Jessica. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction. And um, so I just started my year two of my doctoral program this fall. This is the first time I'm joining this event, and this is the first time I'm presenting my work to the public. So thank you so much for everyone who is here today. And I'm so happy to have this opportunity. And so I'll start with my presentation. So here's the uh, here's are the objectives for my presentation. This is closely in line with my um, doctoral work. And um, so I'll be presenting um, the needs of young adult lymphoma survivors, the relationship between exercise and cancer outcome, and I'll briefly talk about the design of the study that I'm conducting. It's an exercise intervention. Uh, I'll talk about the study, um, the theory that supports this intervention and its method methodology. And I'll also present some considerations surrounding the method methodology of this uh, exercise intervention. So first we will take a look at some statistics of young adult um, living with lymphoma. So there are two main subtypes of lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma is, is more common than Hodgkin lymphoma, um, which is now the sixth most common, commonly diagnosed cancer in Canada. And lymphoma and, the sub, and its subtypes are among the most commonly diagnosed cancer among young adults age um, 18 to 39. But fortunately, um, lymphoma is highly curable and it's often treated with curative therapies. And traditionally, uh, lymphoma is treated with multi-agent chemotherapy, radiation, and or immunotherapy. Um, lymphoma is the most treatable cancer in young adults. Um, however, it's, it comes with many um, treatment-related toxicity, toxicities, including um, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease due to the um, toxicity of chemotherapy agents and radiation therapy um, that these patients usually receive. So because we know that young adults aged 18 to 39, they face distinct challenges comparing to cancer survivors of other age group or developmental stage. Um, cancer treatment often have negative impacts on their physical and mental well-being. Um, young adulthood is very challenging. It's a very challenging period for um, these cancer patients because they're usually at, at the stage of developing personal and social um, milestones, like competing education, pursuing a career, or building important uh, social relationships, um, etc. And the cancer treatment side effects and the unhealthy lifestyle can um, have substantial impact on their quality of life and long-term cancer prognosis outcome um, in these group of patients. And in fact, the cure rate of lymphoma have increased so prominently that the long-term toxicity of the treatment is considered the major cause of mortality among uh, young adult lymphoma survivors, uh, especially for people who were diagnosed with early or intermediate stage um, lymphoma. And because of these challenges, um, we are going to need specialized and tailored survivorship care for this group of um, cancer survivors. And the priority is to restore their physical health and help them to reintegrate into the society to their pre-cancer pre life. And here I'll present some um, um, association between activity, physical activities and cancer outcome. And as we know, there are different types of health promotion intervention that can have potential benefit to the health of uh, the general population and for cancer patients and survivors. But um, 
the evidence is showing that physical activity is the most promising option that demonstrate the highest therapeutic value on both psychological and physical health. And there is a growing body of evidence to suggest that um, physical activity can improve many cancer related health outcomes. So here is the, on the screen, I'm showing a list and all these outcomes, they have um, strong and extensive evidence um, in the literature to show the relation, to demonstrate the relationship between um, exercise, physical activities, and these outcomes. So um, health-related quality of life, it's, um, it's a, a multidimensional concept. It usually includes um, subjective evaluation of different aspects of life from the patient themselves. Uh, physical functioning, this one is also very important because it's um, common across all cancer types patients to uh, experience the um, decline in physical functioning and during the treatment and after treatment. So maintenance of function, physical function is important for these patients because it is associated with um, independency after treatment. Um, anxiety, depression, cancer-related fatigue and sleep quality, they're also strongly associated with physical activity, both pre-cancer diagnosis or after cancer uh, treatments. And finally, for biomarkers and prognosis and survival, um, these two have not been proven in all types of cancer patients yet because the majority of the evidence in the literature is coming from um, cancer patients of the common types such as breast or colon cancer but um, there is study um, evidence to show, for example, uh, breast cancer survivors um, who are engaged in exercise in after their treatment, they experience some benefits and there's some benefits in some biomarkers such as fasting insulin. Um, for prognosis and overall survival, it is also, these are also strongly associated with both pre and post diagnosis um, in some cancer patients. And here is the evidence in the current literature on lymphoma patients. And the, um, there are different types of study that have uh, reported the association between physical activity and lymphoma specific outcome. Uh, for example, um, improved survival outcome is uh, associated with um, physical activity during and after prognosis in some lymphoma patients. And it's also associated with um, outcome in quality of life in children, adolescents, and young adult um, lymphoma patients. And there are evidence on fatigue as well uh, among adult, young adult and adolescent lymphoma patients. And so with all these evidence confirming the positive effects of physical activity on cancer outcomes, um, in 2019, there's a guideline published by the American College of Sport Medicine. Um, it is um, a set of exercise guidelines for cancer survivors during and post cancer therapy. It's called the FITT, the FIT guideline. It is recommending the cancer survivors to perform specific frequency, intensity, time, and type of uh, exercise to target um, different cancer outcomes. So in general, it is a minimum of three times per week, um, moderate to rigorous level intensity, um, 30 minutes each session, um, and for at least eight to 12 weeks. And also aerobic activity is favored over resistant training. So for cancer survivors, exercise is generally safe, um, but the evidence also is showing that supervised exercise program is superior to unsupervised. And there are some key considerations in exercise intervention. Um, so in order to reduce unwanted uh, adverse effect, medical clearance before the starting of the program is necessary for cancer survivors. 
Also, um, researchers should uh, use pre-exercise assessment to evaluate if there's any effect of the cancer treatment or morbidity that is uh, uh, related to the types or intensity of exercise that this patient can start. Also, any intervention should tailor to um, individual's risk, risk tolerance um, for individual uh, cancer survivor. And so here is uh, some issues that researchers should focus on. Um, we know that all the benefits that is associated with, associated with physical activities, but cancer survivors engagement or adherence to um, this guideline remains uh, suboptimal. And because there is a concern in, in the research field about whether any uh, exercise intervention that is problematic do they actually can motivate uh, patients to increase the activity level sufficiently to improve cancer outcomes? So we need to find out about that. Um, so because we know that um, cancer survivors and exercise intervention could be a com complex issue to tackle, um, it is quite challenging because um, any exercise intervention in any population, not just cancer, not just cancer survivorship, may likely require substantial or sustained behavioral change in the participants. So, to address this this issue, it is necessary to develop theoretically supporting interventions to examine the underlying me mechanism or the active ingredient that make a difference in these uh, exercise intervention to motivate the adherence among the cancer survivors. So next, I'm going to introduce the lymphid intervention, which is uh, my doctoral work. Um, we have just finished finalizing the development development part of this program, and we are moving on to the testing stage soon. So here I'm going to um, share with you the mechanism behind this um, intervention and what is included in it, what is the component within this intervention. So, okay. So first I'll introduce the theoretical framework. Uh, which is self-determination theory. This is the theory that I'm going to use to support um, my intervention. This is a comprehensive, um, I mean, uh, self-determination is a comprehensive um, Markov theory of human potential and motivated behavior that is developed by DC and Ryan uh, back in 1985. This theory uh, helped to predict and explain um, persistent health behavioral changes. And it is very commonly used um, in supporting health interventions such as um, uh, healthy eating, smoking cessation, medical adherence, um, all these kind of um, health related intervention. It is originated from a humanistic or organismic uh, perspective, meaning that this theory emphasis on humans' inherent uh, motivational propensity to growth. And it tells us how we can support uh, this process. And there are a few main concepts uh, within this um, broad theory. So I'll be introducing two sub-theories in the next slide. So this is one of the sub-theory within um, self-determination theory. Uh, it's called the organismic uh, integration theory. Uh, it suggests that human motivation is located on a continuum corresponding to the degrees of rel relative autonomy. And so it shows here one end and it's more controlled motivation and the other end is more self-determined or more autonomous motivation. And if we look at this row here, um, this theory also tells us there are distinction between intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, and a motivation. So for intrinsic motivation, uh, it involves the engaging behavior that is from a more internalized drive. For example, it's 
and the driving force is about your interest, it's about um, challenging, it's about enjoyment. And for extrinsic motivation, it involves um, engaging in behavior as an instrument to achieve some outcomes, for example, um, external force from social pressure, from avoiding punishment or guilt or shame. For a motivation, it means um, zero drives to engage in the particular behavior. And there are different forms of motivation. These different forms of motivation is corresponding to six different regu reg uh, behavioral regulation styles. So it's shown here from non-regulation to intrinsic regulation. Um, so intrinsic motivation Intrinsic motivation is regulated intrinsically, and the four extrinsic motivation are regulated with um, integration, identification, introjection, and um, external regulation. And for a, a motivation, there is no regulation. And this row shows the reason but for behavior um, that is corresponding to the six uh, different types of regulation styles. So according to self-determination theory, there is a process named um, internalization. That is the central process through which um, the, individu the individual can transform the more ex external regulation styles to achieve more intrinsic regulation motivation. So as the extrinsic motivation uh, becomes more internalized, the individual become more autonomous to engage in behaviors over time. So how do we make this internal internalization process happen? Um, it's, it's, from, it's shown here is through the, the uh, fulfillment of the psychological needs. Um, so I'll show in ne next slide the three um, basic psychological needs theory. Um, it is another sub theory within the self determination theory. It shows that there are three needs, which are autonomy, competency, and relatedness. These three needs must be supported in order to foster a more um, autonomous motivation patterns as well as optimal well being. So, for autonomy, it's meaning that people have. Uh, the need to feel that they are master of their own destiny, that they have at least some form of control over their behavior. Uh, for competency, um, um, this need is about achievement, it's about knowledge and having the skills to perform the task that they think that is important to them. For rela relatedness, it is the feeling of being uh, respected, understood, uh, and that they're belonging to a social group. So the outcome of fulfilling these three needs is the, going to be autonomous motivation and psychological well-being. So this relationship makes um, this self-determination theory um, highly relevant to any health behavior interventions because it tells us what are the active ingredients in health interventions, which are these needs. So if we provide these three needs support in the intervention, then we can achieve the behavior change. So in the next slide, I'll show a logic model of how I think my intervention is going to work for my participants. So these are the three modifiable factors um, as explained in a the theory. Um, I'll be providing need support for these three and psychological needs in my intervention. Um, I'll give more details in the next slide, but um, so the direct outcome from the psychological need satisfaction is going to be motivation, increased exercise level, and enhanced quality of life. So this green path is what I uh, hypothesize my intervention is going to work. And this yellow path is the non-modifiable factors which, is, uh, which are the patient's characteristics, uh, such as their social economic status, their uh, family support, treatment, com 
uh, completion status and or the, their cancer staging, etc. So these factors could um, have impact on activity levels and on their motivation levels. So I will take these factors into consider consideration as well when I do my analysis. So in the next slide, I will show you the components of the, of the lymphate intervention. So there are three major components. Um, there's going to be professional guidance from a kinesiologist. There's going to be digital, digital health technology uh, that involves a, a phone app application. There is going to be a Fitbit, uh, which is an activity tracking device that um, the intervention is going to provide to the participants. So here I have some details about what these components, like the subcomponents within the three major components and how I think they're going to support the needs for autonomy, for competency and relatedness. So basically uh, the participants is going to receive um, a personalized um, exercise program. They're going to uh, meet with the kinesiologist um, every two weeks to discuss their progress and make modification to the ex exercise intervention. I mean, the exercise program as needed uh, depending on their progress. They're going to be able to self-monitor their progress using the phone and Fitbit, and they will connect with their peers and um, other uh, young adult lymphoma survivors in the study. They can connect um, via the um, phone app. So this is how I hypothesize my intervention is going to um, help these patients to achieve more autonomous motivation to perform um, exercise after the treatment. So here I listed some more justification of the inter intervention components. Uh, I believe that um, professional guidance uh, are necessary because uh, the it can keep the participants engaged and to ensure safety um, during the intervention. Um, so also the exercise program, I believe that it should be tailored to um, cancer survivors, individual baseline, baseline fitness and risk tolerance. And um, also comparing to traditional face-to-face -face healthcare, uh, I believe that uh, digital health tools can be better engaging the young adults to um, um, make sure that they can assume greater responsibility for health promotion, health promoting activities such as uh, exercise. For activity tracking device, um, there are significant potential with regard to behavioral change techniques and uh, it is shown in um, some current um, systematic reviews. So in the first half of the presentation, I covered three objectives on young adult lymphoma survivors, um, on physical activities and cancer outcome, as well as um, the self-determination theory-based intervention. So in the next section, I will talk about method methodological issues in exercise interventions, as well as uh, feasibility policy studies. So exercise intervention, um, these are often considered complex health intervention because they typically comprising multiple components. For instance, um, in the research team, they, uh, the researchers might be required to perform a variety of complex, uh, of complex behavior while delivering the treatment. For example, in my intervention, there are um, kinesiologists involved, there are nursing involved, there are um, uh, oncologists involved. So the intervention design, uh, it's, it's uh, consisting of personalized and tailored uh, activities. So it's a bit more complex and there are, so like I said, there are a large number of stakeholders that can be involved in different stage of the delivery of this intervention. So for complex intervention, uh, the, a randomized control trial is the gold standard 
experimental design to allowing the researcher to estimate the efficacy of the intervention as well as the causal relationship in study design. So it is frequently used in drug trials to test the efficacy of a new drug. And the design of a RCT include double blinding procedures. It includes a placebo control, which, is, which means we give one group of the patient a placebo and we give the real drugs to the uh, another group of the participants. And this will allow the researcher to tell uh, the effect of being given the medication in the group that is receiving the root drug. So choosing a proper control condition is one of the most funda fund fundamental aspects of um, the design in a RCT. And the control is an essential element that allows us to uh, allows the researcher to discriminate whether the intervention has an effect on the participants. And however, in behavioral intervention studies, such as exercise intervention, because it involves behavioral change, it's more complex than just um, the drug trial. And there are many non-specific factors that can um, impact the outcome of the study. For example, in the exercise intervention, um, there's going to be a social interaction between the researcher and the participants. Um, so these are the um, things that we have to consider while we design the intervention. If the exercise program is what makes the difference. Um, so I'll show in the next slide, because in the exercise intervention, it is not really possible to make a, a equivalent of a placebo medication, like in the drug trial uh, in the RCT. There are different options for the researchers to choose um, as a comparison condition in the control arm, control group. Um, so there's going to be inactive controls and active controls. So inactive controls, it will allow the researcher to detect the outcome of the intervention as, com as compared to the other group, the control group where, uh, where they will not receive the intervention. So the terminology used for control group is not standardized. So uh, sometimes it's called usual care, standard care, or no treatment. Um, so for usual care, standard care, or no treatment, uh, usually it means that the participants in the control group receive the care that they normally get from the clinic uh, that is related to their clinical condition. So for example, in um, cancer survivors, they will, people in control group is going to receive um, recommendation from oncologists about exercise. They're going to receive um, uh, pamphlets about information on exercising. Um, so in the research, in the intervention, um, we will recommend that the participant in the control group that they can maintain their usual habit or activity level um, as they usually will, and we'll provide uh, information about exercise to them. Uh, for the waitlist control group, it is meaning that the control group participant is going to receive the intervention treatment when the entire study is over. So they'll be placed on a waitlist and they'll receive usual care during the delay. But when the intervention, when the research study is over, they'll receive the um, intervention. So for this type of uh, inactive control, the limitation is that um, um, because we know that the blinding of uh, participants and the research uh, team is impossible because they will know that they're being placed in a um, wait list. And so it's not as robust. Um, as in a drug trial where, where they will receive a placebo medication, so they will not know if they're in the intervention group or in the control group. Uh, but there's benefit to this type of control group as well, because it is 
going to be an easier intervention design for the researchers. Uh, using waitlist control can help with recruitment and retention, and it is more ethical because um, um, all, we will know that all participants in the study is going to at some point receive the intervention um, so that everyone is going to guarantee the benefits of, let's say, um, the exercise. And so for active control, it's also called attention control because it's, it is intended to provide the control group with a similar amount of attention and social uh, interaction as in the intervention groups, meaning that um, um, there is a pre-established intervention package for both intervention group and control group. And the control group, um, I mean, and in the intervention group, they're going to receive um, the, the uh, component that is regarded as the active ingredient of the um, intervention. So the benefits of this kind of active control uh, is that it's controlling, uh, it's controlling for attention in both groups. So they could be blind to um, the study allocation and it's allowing for equal comparison. But the limitation is that it's not always possible because it's making the intervention even more complex and there is going to be burden on human resource, time, infrastructure, and financial support uh, in the research team. So here I'll discuss two major considerations concerning control group design. So there, these are the two main items that the researchers should pay attention on when they design the control group. And so for comparability, this is what I was talking about in the previous slides, because uh, the control group, the fundamental function of it is that it will provide us a comparable condition that allow the researchers to draw a con uh, conclusion regarding the efficacy of the hypothesized active ingredient in the intervention. And due to the complexity of behavioral interventions, such as um, exercise interventions, this could be very challenging. For example, uh, in the exercise intervention, it is not very realistic to ask the participant in the control arm to, in the control group to completely uh, be inactive. So the researchers, we need to be aware of these potential bias or co-founders in the study, and we need to assess them. And for appeals and potential for social threats, this is another consideration that is important that we have to consider in uh, when we design the uh, behavior change intervention. Uh, it means the control group and it uh, has to be appealing to the participants. This can impact recruitment and retention, and it could impact um, um, if we are going to see a lot of dropout or loss to follow up within the control group. Because um, for, for example, in um, exercise interventions, we, the, all the participants are going to know that there are benefits of exercise. So they might be, uh, all want to join the um, intervention group instead of going to the control group where they will not get the intervention. So this is something we have to be care careful when we design the control group. Uh, we need to focus on these two considerations and we need to balance our decision and to make it uh, equally comparable for the study, uh, for us to conduct the study and for the participants to, if it's appealing for them enough to join the study. So in my intervention, in my study, I'm going to choose to use the waitlist um, design because I believe that it is the most ethical. Um, and every participant who joined the study is guaranteed to receive the intervention at the end and the benefits of exercise. So it, uh, I believe that it will help with uh, recruitment and retention in my study as well. So, here I'm going to talk a bit about methodology 
And so after, after knowing all the complexities uh, within an exercise intervention, how are we supposed to start testing once we've developed the intervention? So before starting with the RCT, it is very important to test the feasibility and acceptability of the study and of the components of the study. So here uh, I'll introduce feasibility and power study. Feasibility study is um, an umbrella term. It's used to describe any type of study that is related to preparing for a RCT. For in a um, feasibility study, uh, we can test the clinical, methodological, and procedural issues within the study, such as um, if the components are acceptable to participants, if they're going, if they're going to be compliant with the um, intervention, if the delivery procedure or the logistics of the intervention, are they feasible? Uh, can we recruit page, uh, participants? Can we re retain them in study? Um, and for a past study, it is a subset of feasibility study. So in the past study, um, the research team can have the opportunity to model the intervention and uh, basically conduct the study in a small scale first. So this is what I'll do in my doctoral work, which is to conduct a feasibility and power study for the limb fit intervention. And the goal is to identify areas to, for improvement in the um, bigger RCT trial. So here's uh, the objectives of, of my um, doctoral um, work. Um, is to evaluate feasibility, acceptability of lymphid, and I'll test them the efficacy on these four outcomes. And I'll show you um, the design of my study in the next couple of slides. So it is going to be a pilot, pilot feasibility study with a pre and post design. And the entire duration is four months. Um, there are going to be two arms, the intervention arm, who is going to receive the lymphid program, the control arm, who is going to be a weightless control group. They receive usual care during the intervention and at the end, after the uh, study is over, they will be uh, receiving the intervention at the end. Uh, I'll collect data at this time, this time point. Uh, pre-intervention and at this time point, three months post-intervention. And at a four month time point, I will confirm if the participants in the, con in the control group, did they actually start the intervention to make sure this design is feasible. And here is just a, to describe the study, the sample size, the eligibility criteria for, for participants to join the study. Um, and the setting is going to be in Jewish General Hospital in Montreal. And for sample size, because this is a power study, so I chose a smaller sample size uh, with 30 in total and 15 per arm. And here uh, I'm just showing for my three objectives, feasibility, acceptability, and efficacy, uh, how am I going to assess them? Um, so for feasibility, I'll use a set of progression criteria. For acceptability, I'll ask retrospectively um, if they're satisfied with different aspects of the study. For efficacy, I'll use um, standardized uh, validated questionnaire to assess um, pre and post intervention. And I wanted to show this, um, the progression criteria, criteria for my study. This is um, determined by a uh, consensus among the research team. We had a meeting to discuss our expectation and what is acceptable and not. And we reached the conclusion to have this set of progression criteria. And this is using a traffic light system, which means uh, we want to know if we can actually progress to a bigger trial. If it's below the stop criteria, it, which means we need to make an amendment to this design of the study and in order to progress. And 
Uh, finally, I want to show the expected outcome or significance of this study, uh, which is which include direct impact on short and long term health uh, in young adult lymphoma survivors. Um, there's going to uh, this study is going to increase access to specialized care, especially among the during the pandemic where health promotion. Uh, or exercise resources is um, limited. Uh, we can test the feasibility of the intervention to be delivered in a virtual environment because uh, the entire study is going to be delivered remotely. Um, there's potential to demonstrate the importance of interdisciplinary exercise program with the um, different disciplines and finally, and uh, to examine the, the radical relevancy of the intervention strategy in um, self-determination theory-based research. Um, so that is the end of this presentation and thank you everyone again.